so uh, talking about uh, the most important thing uh, component that's there is the security so considering that there are some participants basically who are not from computer science background and even if uh, there are uh, like faculties respected faculties and scholars from uh, computer science it's very important that uh, we actually understand the genesis or the underlying concepts related to security so first and foremost the question that i ask uh, usually is that what exactly is security so there are very ambiguous definitions that actually uh, come in when you talk of security the whole concept of security so yeah jahangir yes sir what do you make of, what do you make of security so what do you think what security is all about so uh, i think security is uh, like uh, to secure our system with the data transfers uh, and the network uh, keeping the data in, in integrated form uh, shubham sir and uh, Yes, sir. Uh, so, what do you make of security, sir? Sir, the security means uh, you know to secure our computer from the outside world, like uh, to secure the computer from the malicious programs, the other things like that. Okay, let me uh, let me put it uh, in a different perspective first. So, uh, as you, uh, I have some very vital information, or I have something very precious uh, for me. Okay, now. Uh, what i need to do is that i need to actually safeguard uh, this uh, uh, whatever precious thing or whatever the vital information this is i actually need to safeguard it yeah it's or is she come on okay yeah so uh, let's assume that i need to safeguard whatever this information critical information for me uh, is there so there are two basic possible approach uh, that i can take approach one will be that i take this information and i store it in a box and i lock it down so once i lock it down this information then i take this uh, box and i go somewhere maybe in a sahara desert or a pacific ocean i dig a hole and that's where i place this information i place this box okay the second approach that i take in this case is that i lock down this information right and then i put it right in front of the person who is actually threatening to take away this information so sharda if i have to say that which approach is safer which one would you prefer uh, sorry you know maybe the way. one maybe the one which we put at sahara yeah maybe the one which we put at sara desert uh, is this an like an agreed upon answer that uh, the one where we put it uh, in the sara desert or in a distant place away from the attacker that is the place to be amrina yes sir yeah so uh, what what do you think sir i also agree with jahangir right now you agree with jahangir right now <laughs> great yeah yeah rishika ma'am so i will actually quote a very simple example for the same thing all of us uh, are very much acquainted with the rc4 algorithm rc4 algorithm uh, basically yes. when when uh, when rondrius actually designed uh, this rc4 algorithm right that was a time when uh, the uk intelligence services they came up with the theory that we actually already have designed it so essentially what uh, uh, their uh, the theory is that we have designed it already and we have been using it as well but uh, down the line it's been more than uh, 50 years now and nobody has ever given credit of rc4 to those people the reason for that being very simple whenever you design a new algorithm uh, no shoes ma no shoes so whenever you actually design an algorithm for a security algorithm or an encryption algorithm right you cannot just say that my algorithm is good enough my algorithm is secure enough just because the outside world does not know about it if you want to uh, make a claim of such nature that my algorithm is good my algorithm is safe then you actually need to put it in front of the attacker right you use this algorithm and then you go ahead and ask the algorithm ask the attacker this is the algorithm this is how i have secured things using this algorithm now go ahead and try to break it 
So essentially, in the world of network security, hiding a packet in a Sahara desert does not qualify as security. What qualifies as security is the data is there, you have locked it your, using your own mechanism, and you put it right in front of the guy who is trying to steal it from you and ask him, I have secured my information, your turn to break it down. So that's how actually we work around the concept of security. Now, securing uh, of information may be related to data, may be related to the network. So eventually, the whole idea is that there are eavesdroppers out there, there are attackers out there, right? There are uh, these uh, invaders out there. The whole idea is that the race that's going on between the good boy and the good guys and the bad guys the uh, good guys need to win. So that's the whole uh, premises of this. A uh, few years back, uh, I was uh, giving a talk in Jaipur, and it so happened that, uh, I guess it was Banastali University. It so happened that uh, uh, over the lunch, there's another speaker who was a retired uh, brigadier in Indian Army. So he was also there uh, as an expert. So over the lunch, he discussed a very important episode that I would like to share with you people. He said that uh, during the 1999 Kargil War, uh, I'm sure everybody knows about that episode. So uh, think about this. Say Kargil is something around uh, 200 kilometers from Srinagar City. So what he said is that uh, whatever information exchange was uh, taking place between the uh, on field, uh, uh, these uh, military officers and the, uh, uh, the higher ranks set up in Delhi or in Srinagar. He said that whatever information needed to be exchanged between these two parties, say, uh, whatever moves uh, they needed to move next, that information they actually uh, never could basically uh, uh, exchange uh, over uh, the network or over the telephones or whatever. They had to actually seal that information in like literally in a briefcase and then uh, a major of an army rank would actually uh, travel from Kargil to Delhi to exchange an information. So because the ex information was very vital and they could not afford actually this information going into the uh, enemy hands. So system was uh, so uh, vulnerable at that point of time that actually they could not rely on it. Though things have changed uh, over the last 20 years, a lot now, a lot of work is being done uh, in this part of the world uh, on security. But there are, uh, this is an ongoing race that's never going to actually end, I guess. So wherever you try to fit in those, uh, uh, those loopholes, uh, new ones are being created. So it's, a, it's actually a race, basically, that's there. Now, why do, uh, uh, what leads to this requirement of the security? See, we say the first thing that we assume is that the channel is never secure. The channel that you're using for transmission is actually never secure. So whatever uh, security you have to place in, it has to be uh, on basically the uh, endpoints that you're actually using. So the, with this assumption that every network is actually vulnerable, right? We have to secure our information against uh, uh, intruders, against hackers. We have to secure our information against disgruntled employees. Say, for example, there's a company X, and company X actually uh, has some very vital information with the vice president. Tomorrow, for some uh, uh, for some reasons, uh, there may be money, uh, the VP gets fired. Now, when the VP gets fired, VP actually has a lot of information about the company setup, about the company secrets, and all that. And there's every possibility that being a disgruntled employee, he might actually compromise the security of a company. So again, uh, a possible reason why we need security. Uh, poor security uh, practices in an organization. See what happens most of the time that whenever a new company or whenever a new organization comes up, the first thing they do is that they invest a lot on infrastructure. They uh, invest a lot of uh, stuff on getting these all these uh, and these fancy things uh, in place, but very little attention is being, uh, very little budget is being truly really reserved for the security practices. And what they don't understand essentially is that 
putting all that money into the infrastructure can be compromised with a very small loophole in your security. And the examples for that being very evident in the last one month. More than uh, 100 uh, top-notch companies actually uh, became a victim of uh, ransomware attacks. So the simple reason for that being that these were like big uh, top companies and there were security vulnerabilities, there were security low posts, and those were actually uh, uh, violated or exploited by the attackers. Then the very old uh, viruses and the spyware concepts that's there, or the accidental damage. So you actually accidentally uh, damage uh, maybe your uh, data wherever it's stored or malicious use. So all these together actually lead uh, to a place which actually makes us realize the importance of your uh, information or the security that needs to be informed, secure, right? Four basic concepts or four basic uh, uh, services related to security that we actually have there and which we aim to actually achieve. You have confidentiality. Uh, then uh, you have, Sharda, what's confidentiality? There are some basic terms actually I'm using because there are some uh, uh, non computer science people. So, so security is basically essential to everyone, be, you, be it like you're from computer science or non computer science. So these are things that uh, every one of us should know. So that's why I'm starting with uh, these basic things. Sharda, any idea what's confidentiality? So protecting information from being accessed um, by unauthorized uh, parties. Uh, true, Shahid. That's absolutely right. And how do you achieve that? Yes, Shahid. So, um, so we uh, we give authorization uh, authorization to only those people who are uh, who can uh, access these uh, files. So, what's the mechanism that you use for that? So encryption. Yeah. So encryption. Password protection to... can be used. Password protection essentially is not uh, as a means for confidentiality. So, so, so like actually... RC4, uh, like RC4, RC4 ke liye to both the parties note the uh, encryption and disc uh, description. Agar See, ko pata hai... uh, uh, see what you are saying essentially is basically symmetric key cryptography. Now, in symmetric key cryptography, they know the key, and that's that's that's, that's the way it operates basically. Because if they don't know the key, both the parties don't know the key, then who is going to encrypt and who is going to decrypt? But password pro password using of passwords is essentially a, a way of uh, implementing the authentication. So, if you want to basically authenticate a certain user, say for example, somebody wants to join the FDP, right? Yeah. Now, what I'm asking asking that uh, participant is that if you are a verified uh, participant of this uh, FDP, you actually need to uh, give me some credentials. You may use a name, you may password, and I will let you join uh, this, right? So it's a way of authentication. So I'm actually trying to authenticate that participant whether or not you are the actual verified participant, right? So uh, if you're if you're talking of uh, confidentiality, then essentially. It's basically that the uh, message or the data should be readable or should be accessible or should make any sense to the person to whom it's intended. Say, for example, my first way, uh, because uh, network security has a very major role uh, to play in uh, military services, I'll put a simple example. Uh, say, for example, a uh, message delivered uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, New Delhi to Sri Lanka, for example. Now, this message gets intercepted uh, by uh, the military of Pakistan. Let's just take an assumption. Now, you cannot stop the interception. That's very much there. As I said, that there is uh, communication media that's very much vulnerable. So you cannot actually stop the uh, interception. But what you need to stop is that even if they get the message, even if they are able to intercept, which they are, which they definitely are, even if they are able to intercept the message, they should not be able to understand the content of the message. So encryption for those people who are not from computer science, encryption actually is a mechanism wherein we actually change the form of the message. So if the message is, hi, how are you? It should look like something, uh, some three numbers followed by a hash, followed by some other number, uh, followed by anything that does not make any sense to me. 
so i read the message i read the contents but still i cannot understand what exactly it is so this is essentially what we call as confidentiality then uh, as shada rightly pointed out password so that's the mechanism wherein you try to authenticate the user that the user is valid user or not third important aspect of that being the integrity that means once the message uh, is basically sent from the source and it's received to the receiver the receiver actually needs to verify that the incoming message is the message that has not been altered that has not been modified so there is a possibility say for example uh, uh, you do a shopping with amazon now once you do a shopping with amazon amazon actually uh, bills you uh, 1000 rupees for that particular shopping now what do you do is that uh, you uh, actually use your credit card to pay the bill and the message that goes to the bank is pay 1000 rupees to amazon now if somehow this message gets modified into pay only two more zeros or added to 1000 that will make it pay 1 lakh to amazon so there's a very little modification there's very little uh, change in the uh, in the message content but it has a very huge impact so the receiver actually needs to verify needs to make sure that whatever the message is coming to me it's the actual message or else if the message has been altered if the message has been changed then the receiver needs to make sure that he has this understanding he realizes that the message has been altered there are possibilities then whether he can go for the recovery or not so that's like going to the uh, deeper uh, this digging deeper with these concepts what's very important here is that whenever you make those transactions those transactions go in a form which are basically the uh, unaltered form so if you try to achieve that something like that this is what you call actually data integrity then there's access control there's access control in terms of access control this is a very important uh, concept uh, say for example uh, you are uh, working at a cba office now when you are working at a cba office there are very various departments in the cba office so there's a department that looks after crime there's a department that looks after say for example terrorism there's a department that looks for drugs and all stuff so let's take this assumption now a person staying in the department of drugs should not get access to the files uh, that are there with the terrorism department or a person staying there should get files uh to the level of say for example there are hierarchy of uh, these drug lords so these are there are some local drug lords then there are those uh, drug lords who are basically of uh, uh top category drug lords so uh, employee as uh, an employee clerk level employee may have access to the files of the local drug lords but he may not have access to the files of like those top notch gangsters right so what i'm trying to say here is that you need to maintain a control of who gets access to what and when say so being in cba officer that does not mean i go into an office and access uh, files at like 2 uh, in the night so who who gets access how much of an access does he get and then when he possibly gets access so you need actually access all those uh, you need actually control all those parameters that's what you basically what i uh, understand by access control then there is a non repudiation non repudiation says that if i get an agreement with shubham sir and once we make this agreement uh, tomorrow for some weird reasons i try to uh, backtrack i try to retract i say that i never got involved into this uh, agreement with you so that's the case that should not happen that's something called a non repudiation now these are the concepts that are very really essential if you try to create a system that you are claiming to be a secure system right now having said that all these systems we assume that uh, there is a possibility that an attack may be carried out when you say an attack may be carried out an attack essentially is of two types the attack may be a kind of a passive attack or the attack may be a uh to attack amrina uh, can you please differentiate between a passive and an active attack yes sir passive and the active attacks yeah 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 mm. yeah that's okay 
this is alia ma'am i guess hello yeah i guess active attack is where the attacker tries to modify the content and passive one is just uh, he observes the data he takes the data right. and does not modify yeah exactly the masquerade one the masquerade one and right. there is a modification and denial of the services right 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 yeah. so basically uh, uh, as jahangir rightly said see there are two types of attacks that you are trying to carry out uh, one attack is that uh, i'll put a very simple example for all those uh, non computer science uh, students also and uh, faculty honorable faculty members to understand say for example there's a very usual practice with these uh, uh, the security agencies that uh, they actually go into uh, tapping phones of say for example there's a there's somebody who's on radar so what they do simply is that they go in and they start tapping his phone so they start to uh, listening to the conversation that is that are taking place there now what's happening is that they are actually accessing the data without the person or the involved parties knowing that the data is being accessed so all they are doing that they are very silently sitting in a corner and simply listening to the information that is being exchanged to put it very, uh, in a very simple possible way so you are actually attacking but you are attacking in such a way that uh, the two parties involved in the communication even they don't know that they are being attacked so this is what you call as a as uh, was is right said that the victim is actually unaware of an attack is being is taking place so whenever we say traffic analysis whenever we say that uh, we are trying to analyze a packet so this essentially becomes a passive attack as long as i do not start changing the contents so for example the the uh, uh, so for example data is basically being uh, uh, communicated between two parties i intercept the data and once i intercept the data as i said the example of the amazon i intercept the data that pay 1000 to amazon then i modify it make uh, this uh, uh, 1000 into 1 lakh and then resend this message so the moment i intercept the data and then i basically modify the data this is what becomes an active attack so in active attack there's every possibility that the uh, parties that the communicating parties uh, do understand that we are under an attack that we are being threatened okay what uh, packet sniffing that we are going to discuss today is basically a kind of a passive attack this is an attack wherein you try to actually listen to whatever whatever is being uh, communicated right now the most important question is that why do i need uh, this uh, packet sniffing so for all those uh, who do not understand uh, uh, the term sniffing over here so uh, sniff is sniffing is nothing but just listening to what is being communicated so you try to basically listen to without actually uh, uh, actually making any modifications and uh, when i say packet what happens is that the moment you send an email or the moment you send some data to another party this data usually is in large size files say for example you send a 1 mb file or a 1 gb file the network is not in a position actually to handle those large files so what it does is that it breaks down these files into smaller size files the smaller size check chunks that are there are basically what are being transmitted over the network so uh, when the uh, when these chunks uh, reach the intended uh, recipient they are reassembled at that point and then the message is being recreated from that point onwards so this is what you call as a packet so packet is a very small chunk of the actual information and with every packet there is some uh, important information associated say for example where from this packet is coming uh, which path or which road is this uh, packet going to take and where finally will it end up okay so this is what packet sniffing is all about there are various ways of doing this packet sniffing there are various tools the tools may be software based the tools may be hardware based a lot of tools are there actually that we can actually make use of for doing this packet sniffing purpose packet sniffing can be done for both purpose it can be done for the good and it can be done for the bad so the good people use uh, this packet sniffing in order to determine if there is anything wrong with the network if there is anything that needs uh, that needs their attention in case there is some uh, this network troubleshooting that needs to be done in case the uh, data is not being uh, the uh, it's being like the uh, problems of this uh, data getting choked and uh, 
uh, or overflow. So all these things, a network uh, administrator needs to actually analyze his traffic to see if there are any issues with his network. So what he does is that he makes use of this uh, packet sniffing uh, to basically determine if something is wrong with his network. Then the darker side of it. Uh, you are actually sitting at an airport. You are actually logging in uh, to your maybe social media accounts or you are actually logging into your bank account or something. By making use of an open network or an open Wi-Fi, which we are very used to doing, by making use of an open network, connecting yourself to an open network, which is not actually secure, uh, which I'm going to actually demonstrate as well. By uh, we simply go in, look for the which one, which Wi-Fi is uh, available, which is which Wi-Fi is open here. Simply go in and we log in, and immediately the first thing uh, we do is that we start uh, logging into our these uh, social media accounts. We start uh, doing something with the banks or transactions or uh, payments and all that without actually understand the consequences. Uh, one of the good examples that was this, that was actually actually uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, demonstrated by Zwarsar as well, that how we are actually being enticed uh, by um, you know, these phishing attacks and other possible these uh, attacks. So uh, what's happening is that there are people, there are these attackers who are actually uh, staying right out there, sniffing whatever traffic is being transmitted. So you go and you connect yourself to an open network. You go and open some of you, uh, connect yourself to a uh, non secure network and the data starts flowing and the moment data starts flowing this data is being analyzed uh, by let's call him a uh, let's call him a uh, bad guy so once the data gets analyzed yes us uh, we are actually on uh, uh, slide 2 only us is asking whether we are on slide 2 so uh, they start analyzing and that's where they try to look for is there some inform uh, important information that I can actually utilize or that I can actually take away. Okay, uh, so that's where uh, uh, Deepthi, ma'am, uh, I'm actually using slide one only because I'm going to a demo, so I'm not using any slides. Uh, so that's where actually they exploit these. Uh, uh, so that packet sniffing can be actually uh, used to exploit. Uh, our uh, this uh, information okay so i'll uh, stop uh, presenting these slides and i'll simply go and yeah so we are now actually sharing the whole screen Okay, right. So one of the tools very frequently used for uh, this packet analysis. Remember, this is not the only tool. There are a lot of other tools as well. Uh, there's TCP dump, there's wind dump, uh, right? There is uh, solar winds. But one of the very frequently used uh, tool is uh, Wireshark, as Rishi Kamem rightly said, yes, ma'am. So one of the very frequently used uh, tool and one of the very powerful tools for doing this uh, packet sniffing is your Wireshark tool. And this is the tool that we are actually going to use today uh, to demonstrate uh, how do we actually sniff packets and what information can we actually possibly get uh, by sniffing these packets. Okay. Uh, so all you need to do to use the Wireshark is that Wireshark is basically compatible with all uh, various these uh, uh, operating systems. As a matter of fact, if somebody of you is interested in uh, going to network security as a student or as a researcher, uh, then I would suggest. Uh, having basically a, a virtual copy or having this Kali Linux installed on your system. There are a lot of tools actually available with your uh, Kali uh, Linux. So Wireshark is also available there. But if you're using a Windows, you can actually simply go on and download the Wireshark, get the executable file, run it, and this thing will be installed on your system. It's a very simple installation. So once you have this Wireshark uh, installed, the screen looks something like this. What is there on? Uh, what i'm trying to share with you essentially what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to capture the traffic that gets originated in the network that i am connected to and what you are seeing there is the local area uh, connections wi-fi and this when adapter bluetooth network connection these are various interfaces actually uh, from which i can actually capture some data if the data is available right 
so right now currently i'm actually connected uh, to a wi-fi network at this place okay so as you can see them there's some moment of the data taking place so what i can do here is that i can simply go ahead and start uh, if you can see the blue uh, button in the top left corner i can simply go ahead and try and capture some traffic from this network so what essentially you're seeing on your screen right now is the is that whatever traffic is uh, basically whatever information is being exchanged on my network right i'm trying to actually try to get uh, or capture some of that traffic whatever is possible to be captured so once i see that i have got enough data uh, for analysis purposes i can here on top of left i can simply stop that capture and now what you see is a lot of data actually that i actually captured now with all of this information that's there i will try to analyze this traffic and see if i can get any information that's of interest to me that i can actually use now once i try to uh, basically uh, introduce the concept of packet sniffing i said packet is nothing but a chunk of the actual message so what you see here these individual uh, rows one uh, with these one two three four numbers they are nothing but they are packets and with each packet as i said earlier also that with each packet there is some kind of information associated so what is that information say for example uh, the time field here tells me that when i try to capture this uh, uh, packet the source field that you see here is that it shows the ip address from which this traffic uh, basically was uh, the traffic originated from which the message was sent uh, the destination is basically giving me the ip address uh, informing you that uh, the machine carrying this particular IP address is the one to which the, in, the packet was intended to. Uh, for all those non computer science, uh, these uh, uh, participants, there's something called as a protocol. So, protocols are basically the rules or the constraints which we make use of in uh, our uh, this network communication. Whatever network communication takes place, uh, whatever uh, social media photographs you upload, whatever emails you send, whatever uh, banking uh, transactions you perform, all of these things are actually governed by a set of protocols, by a set of rules. And uh, these rules determine that how secure your message is, how it goes, how the connection is established, how the connection is stopped, right? Who gets the connection, who does not get the connection, who gets identified how. So all of these informations are actually uh, defined and decided by the protocols. So this, as you see here, is the protocol that was involved for this particular packet. Then uh, you see a length field. And when I say this length field, this length field actually indicates the size of that packet. So whatever packet you're trying to send, what is the size of that packet? Now see, since I said uh, earlier also that the message actually gets divided into packets. So these messages are actually of very large size and we cannot size, send a very large size packet, a very large size message over the network because network has its own constraints. There are something called as um, MTUs associated with the network, right? So there's a uh, there's a maximum uh, limit uh, to which uh, a network actually can allow a packet size to be. So because of those reasons, uh, we have actually have to fragment or we actually have to divide the process is called as fragmentation. We actually divide these packets into smaller size packets and then these smaller size packets are what we actually send across the network and at the receiving end, we simply reassemble them. Now, this is very important information for traffic analysis when we say that the uh, length of the packet, how uh, large the packet is. Then there's information, some other information uh, with every packet, there goes an uh, additional information, as I said, we normally call those headers. So there's at least a minimum of 20 bytes of information associated with every packet that goes there. And those 20 bytes information contain a lot of uh, information in terms of port numbers, IP addresses, lengths, offsets, segmentation addresses. So there are a lot of addresses that goes into there. So this is the rest of the packet, rest of the information that's available there. As you can see, uh, in uh, if I'm able to show by the cursor, yeah. So this is the number of packets that I have actually been able to capture, right? So in a minute of, in a, in a, in, in a duration of maybe 30 seconds, I was able to capture some 4,800 packets, right? So what do I do with this information now? I have some information. So what do I do with this information? So before I actually go into the 
uh, analysis of this information then what possibly i can do with this information let's try to uh, understand what possible options i have uh, with my uh, wireshark uh, this tool so every time uh, you want to actually capture a packet or you want to actually start uh, this uh, traffic capturing uh, there you see in the top left corner there's a uh, there's a uh, blue color icon if you can see so all you need to do is very simply you just go ahead you click the button and uh, you can see that uh, the traffic capture starts now uh, from which interface i am actually trying to capture so earlier versions used to allow you uh, to only capture from one specific uh, one specific uh, this interface but the newer versions of virtual actually allow you uh, to capture from multiple interfaces as well now the very important point that you need to understand here is that uh, how do i differentiate that which packet is coming from which interface uh, so if you go into the frame information that i will shortly be discussing the frame information here out here in this case here so with this as you can see there's an interface id of zero which tells you that uh, this particular packet this uh, packet number seven has been captured uh, on interface id zero that means the first interface so if you, there is a uh, if there if you're trying to capture packets from both ethernet as well as from the wi-fi so an interface id will be associated with both of these interfaces uh, say for example interface id means wi-fi connection interface id one means an ethernet connection so that that's how you can actually differentiate that where from you're actually capturing the packet once you have captured sufficient enough uh, packets you can actually stop that capture uh, by using this square uh, button icon uh, it's actually red in color so you can do that uh, to stop the capture next uh, as you can see uh, you can simply uh, if there's a current capture and you actually want to take more traffic you actually want to capture more traffic and you actually restart the current capture by clicking this button uh, this is a very important component over here as you can see these are some capture options so capture options basically lists you uh, uh, the interfaces that are there but what's more important for uh, this capture option is if you can probably see is this uh, button here which is by default enabled it's enable promiscuous mode on all interfaces so this is very important here by default what happens is that your network uh, your nic uh, network interface card is actually bothered about only the traffic that's uh, meant for your device so uh, when you're connected on a network, there are actually multiple nodes connected to that network. There are two types of messages that are actually being transmitted over the network. One is a unicast message, another is a broadcast message. So when it's a unicast message, this is the message that's actually meant for a single user. So there's a uh, defined IP address that this message is going to say, for example, 192.168.0.183. So 192.168.0.183 is an address that is being assigned to one node now when this packet goes to a particular uh, system it identifies that this is me it takes that uh, packet and process whatever it has to do with this usually uh, by default uh, the network interface card is actually interested into the traffic that's intended for it but if i enable this promiscuous mode what happens uh, by enabling this promiscuous mode is that now all that information all the information that's there on my network meant for all other nodes i can actually be able to access that information as well i can actually be able to intercept that information as well so this is a mechanism wherein you try to actually get all the possible information that's in the network information that was not even meant for you so there are two types of sniffing in this case there's a sniffing called as an active sniffing, and then there's a sniffing called as a passive sniffing as well. In case of passive sniffing, these are the ones that actually uh, target your hubs. And your active sniffings, they actually target your switches. So I'm going to discuss that very shortly. Uh, there's something called as MAC flooding or ARP poisoning, and that we use uh, for these uh, modes. Uh, so if I enable this promiscuous mode, what's happening uh, with this is that you are actually able to capture or intercept packets that were not meant for you. So if you try to want to see that uh, I, have an, uh, I have a Wi-Fi connection at my home and whatever is being uh, done on that Wi-Fi connection, whosoever is transmitting what information on that Wi-Fi connection, 
So all you need to do is that you need to enable a promiscuous mode and then try to start intercepting the packets and see that who is accessing what. So uh, this is the promiscuous mode, one of the very important mode. Then there's this capture filter. Uh, I'll shortly discuss this as well. What, what is this all about? Uh, up next uh, is basically if you want to uh, see, you get a very large file. You get a 100 MB or a 500 MB file. And you cannot readily go and analyze this file. So sometimes what you want is that I want to save a particular file uh, for uh, analysis purpose at a later stage. So you can actually save a current file simply by uh, uh, pushing this button. You can actually save it. It by default it will give you all the possible uh, these uh, options. So you can actually save it with some give it some name and save it. And later on, you can using this particular button. You can actually open uh, this uh, captured file and start analyzing it. So it, it does not have to be real time all the time. You can actually do it in an offline mode as well. Once you got your package, whatever you're looking for, simply save those files and a later stage, maybe you can also analyze them as well. Uh, sometimes you just uh, capture a file and then you feel that this important, this capture is not important to me. I don't need it. I got nothing, no information into it. So you just simply want to uh, get rid of the capture. So as I'm doing now, it's giving me an option that do you want to save it or no? So I'm saying, no, I don't want to save it. And there we go. We are done away with this. So this capture is not saved now in this case. OK. Uh, likewise, let me capture some more data so that I can enable these options. Yeah. So these are for the navigation purposes, uh, all of these. So if you want to look for a specific packet, if you want to uh, go to a particular packet, you can simply actually say, I need to go to packet number 50. If there is no, there's no, let's say 662. Wait a minute. Not. Yeah, so if I want to go to a specific packet, I can simply go on. See, this is a very important factor that you need to understand here is that whenever you are trying to apply a filter or whenever you are trying to uh, put some query into the Wireshark, it's a very simple way of uh, uh, communicating to you whether or not the query you are putting is the right query or a wrong query. So if uh, if the if the, if the background of the text box turns green, this is an indication that the query is right. If the, or the syntax is right, if the uh, background color is red, that's an indication that whatever you're trying to do is not the correct way of doing that. That's what I meant by syntax. There is not the correct way of doing that. So this is a very helpful. Uh, so you don't need to actually memorize all those nativities of the syntax simply by typing various options by using a brute force type in various options the moment it turns green gives you a hint that whatever you're trying to do uh, so this is the correct format or this is the correct syntax to of doing that now uh, likewise uh, these are for the navigations so for a particular uh, uh, this uh, packet you can use this for navigation or you can use, simply use uh, uh, these arrow keys from your keyboard as well this is actually going to a specific packet or going to the top of the packet, going to the end of the packet. So these are all possible ways. Uh, if you want to go to the last packet during a live capture, you can actually make use of uh, this button. And then there's a colorization scheme. So for example, when you see this blue color, there's an indication that these are UDP packets. So different uh, protocols are actually being identified by assigning different colors to them. Say blue here means a UDP protocol. Oh, let me get Okay. Then uh, there's, I guess, is the purple, purplish color. So this is for the TCP, right? So there's a colorization scheme actually associated with this. Uh, this is only to uh, differentiate between different protocols of different, different packets of different protocols. So if you want a colorization scheme, you can actually make use of this. If you don't want the colorization scheme, you can simply get rid of it. Uh, even for the good of it, if you want to assign uh, your own colors to your own uh, these uh, packets or protocols, uh, there's a way uh, basically of uh, using this coloring rules as well. 
so this allows you to give colors which color you want to give to which protocol so this is actually a way of um, uh, actually assigning your own colors the way you want them to be okay so this is the default setting if you want to change it you can actually change it as well uh, then these are simply zoom in zoom out features so i don't want to go there now what you see on your screen is divided actually into three uh, three windows the window one is the packet list window this window the blue one highlighted in the blue is the packet list window so this is a window which actually gives you uh, the current packets that you have captured now with each packet there is some information associated with each packet now this is that information is actually given into the second window that you can see here this is called as packet details Packet details gives you the required information that's associated with each packet. And the third window that you see on the lower side here is your packet uh, bytes. So this is a representation of whatever traffic has been captured. So what you see here is essentially a hexadecimal hex uh, representation. You can actually, if you want, you can have a binary uh, version of it as well. So uh, this gives you a uh, certain flexibility to make a modification or something. So the most important part here is there's the middle window. That's your packet detail information. Now you can see the packet detail information. So uh, the first one there is your frame. This gives a lot of information regarding that packet in terms of, uh, as I said, uh, that these packets, they're actually nothing but small, uh, small chunks of the actual file. So this gives some information like when it was captured, and then uh, it tells you which frame number it is or what is the frame length or what are the different protocols uh, that are into this frame. So there's a lot of information uh, that's there uh, related to a particular frame or related to a particular packet that you can get from here. Then there's an Ethernet part of it. So the Ethernet part of it, this is very important. And I will tell you a very important example of this. So during uh, during the revocation of uh, 307 that took place in uh, 2019, when the 307 uh, this article was revoked, internet was suspended all over Jammu and Kashmir for a period of I guess I guess probably one year. I'm not sure, maybe 11 months, 10 months, or one year, something like that. The internet services were actually suspended. Uh, after a certain period, what they did is that at uh, specific offices, uh, they allowed internet access on selected nodes only right so how do uh, they differentiate say for example i will quote an example say for example in the university of kashmir uh, there are uh, some i guess 10 to 15000 nodes connected to the internet now out of these 15000 nodes uh, they all have been assigned ip addresses so what they did is that they did something called as uh, what you call as mac binding so the internet access was given to a particular system uh, whose MAC was actually binded. That means uh, MAC address is an address for those non computer sciences. It's a physical address that's actually, IP address is a virtual address that's given to a system. MAC address is actually a physical address that's associated with your device with which you can actually identify your device. So what they were doing is that they were actually doing this MAC binding. That means internet access was given to particular MAC addresses. So even if I had a valid IP address, even if I had a valid uh, this uh, username password to access the internet at University of Kashmir, I was not able to access it simply because the system would deny me because that MAC address of my system was not listed. The MAC address of my device was not listed into their table, into their system. So that would simply deny me access to the internet. So what possibly I could have done is that if I could somehow capture some traffic if i could capture some traffic and then uh, i could see that the traffic that's flowing if i could get the mac addresses for for a particular packet now the moment i get a mac address that tells me that this particular mac address is actually listed in the system as a device that should be allowed internet access now when i say this packet 174 or 175 this tells me that this packet actually has originated from this system c485 this is a hexadecimal representation c485 0 at fc3 b45 that means from a system which has a mac address of this c485 this is where the packet has originated from and it is going to a system which has a mac address of 3408 d1 5a 
So with this information, what I can do is that I can actually do the MAC binding for my system. So use my IP address, change the IP, uh, this uh, MAC address for my particular system, and then simply boom, I can get the internet access. So this is very important vital information or whenever you try to see that uh, which system is uh, uh, getting uh, accessing which. See, sometimes what happens is that I'll give you a very good example of that in the live demo as well. Sometimes you simply want to know that uh, in my system, the particular number of set of websites should not be visited. And if somehow uh, somebody is visiting, you want to identify who is visiting what, who is uh, browsing what, right? So you can actually analyze those packets there's something, uh, there's a filter called as contains. I'll demo that as well. There's a filter called as contains. If I say uh, TCP contains YouTube. So all those packets that have YouTube associated with them actually will get uh, uh, listed. And thereby, I can actually say that which of these uh, MAC addresses were actually trying to access YouTube from the um, organizational network. So these can actually identify that which machine is doing what. Uh, I will again quote a very similar case. Um, uh, in this case, during this uh, 370 article, what happened is that in the middle of it, uh, suddenly uh, at our own university, this thing happened is that uh, there's a team of uh, officers uh, that uh, who came to our uh, this, uh, campus. And they went to a particular department. I won't name the department. They went to a particular department. They went to a particular room. They went to a particular device just to see that the internet was accessed from that device. So the only way uh, they actually got this information is that once they analyzed the packets and they saw the uh, Ethernet addresses used, and they saw the IP address used, and they saw which uh, devices these addresses were assigned to. That's how people from outside came to the uh, Sri University, to a particular area of Hazrat Bal, to a particular university, to a particular department, to a particular room, just to find out that internet was accessed from that place. <laughs> so that's how uh, vital information uh, these, uh, this kind of an analyst can provide you. Again, uh, this is the uh, IP uh, information. So what IP protocol or version you are using, whether you are on IP4 or you are on IP6. This source, what you see here, is the source IP address from which the traffic was generated, the IP address, not the MAC address. And this is a destination IP address to which this it was uh, the packet was intended to go. There are other uh, uh, fields. If you're a computer science student that you do have information about headers. So these are the various header fields, time to leave, fragment offset, protocol being used, checksum. So these are all the header fields that you see on your packet, those 20 bytes that I was discussing. So that's all that information that you have. And uh, again, if you're a computer science student that you do have understanding that we the packets are not associated with no. device only they're also associated with the uh, processes the processes that generate and the way to identify those processes is shy how do you identify the process which process is involved so i don't know sir. we use port numbers right so these are ports basically uh, associated so uh, the description of which protocol and which port you are using, all that information is also available in this case. So a lot of talk, basically, uh, what exactly it does. So let's get into uh, some, some work and let's see if we can get some information that we will be interested in knowing. OK, let's start fresh. So what I'm doing here is that I'm starting to uh, capture packets on this uh, 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 Wi-Fi interface. And now I'm going to browse some information. So let's start with my own university. I'm going to Kashmir University. So yeah, there we go. This University of Kashmir website. Now what you need to understand here is very important that uh, though it can, uh, actually uh, capture uh, all kind of traffics of different protocols it can capture. But if the information is encrypted, if the information is secured by encryption, there's nothing you can do using Wireshark. It's a very simple thing. So all that information that's being uh, communicated over, uh, over secure means or HTTPS, 
uh, this is the information that's actually encrypted and nothing you can do unless you can break the encryption unless you can decrypt those packets there's nothing you can do but whatever information is there uh, that is being transferred over http uh, that's uh, what's vulnerable that's something you can exploit now to simply see your browser even helps you to find out if you want to see that whether the communication is staying over https or http it highlights over here if you see the site information in this case now the connection is secure that means you are actually making use of https so whatever information is being here uh, there's there's an uh, ssl encryption that has been used in this case so even if you are able to capture that packet there's not much you can do about these packets unless uh, you can successfully break that encryption algorithm or you can decrypt that packet or you can crypt analyze it so uh, so even if i navigate this website right right so there's nothing i can do much about the information but the moment i go into these various schools of university of kashmir say for example if i go into a school of law of university of kashmir if i go into department of law what i see on my top left corner is that this thing is not secured by ssl this is not secured by https this is an http connection okay so this is a kind of information that i may be able to if i'm able to capture it there may be some information that I'll be able to get. So what we see here is the uh, website of law department, right? Uh, let's go into the photo gallery. Now remember, uh, taking the assumption that uh, you are just navigating the University of Kashmir website or you are just navigating some particular website or a social media or anything you are navigating and someone out there on your network is running a Wireshark capture and he's trying to see what you are doing. Put it in that perspective that might help you to understand it so as a user i'm going to the law department website and i'm trying to see that whatever is there in the law department so i look at the gallery there are some of these photographs okay professor ak bansal from delhi university is delivering a lecture There's some other people there. It's running very super slow because I'm having these captures. So yeah, these are some of the gallery photographs. Remember, this can be of uh, any website, whatever you're trying to look. As long as that's an HTTP, we are interested into that. Okay, what else we got there? Some workshops. Let me see who's there. Okay, I guess. Let's go to the wire shark and ask him to stop the capture. So we have stopped the capture and uh, we have captured somewhere around fifty-five thousand packets we have been able to capture right so there's a very important uh, tool uh, as, uh, in wireshark which is called as a filter now to analyze all these five fifty-five thousand packets is going to actually take me time and i have this understanding that i'm trying to look for the packets which were not transferred over a secure connection right and i do know that that's http See, it turned green. So I'm asking him, give me only those uh, uh, packets that were uh, basically transferred over the protocol HTTP. And here we go. So these are called actually filters. Filters are actually of two types. Uh, you have uh, display filters and you have capture filters. It's running very slow because I've been running it for a very long time now. So there are uh, display filters and then there are uh, capture filters. So all of this information that you see here, is because of the display filter now if you want to only capture http type uh, traffic or an ftp type traffic or a tcp type traffic then there's a way of using a capture filter by setting on the capture filter you can actually capture specific type of uh, these uh, specific type of uh, traffic that you are looking for so there's a lot of information out there a lot of packets out there so let's see i was uh, looking at those images in the law department 
let's see if I can get any of them. It's a partial content. There's something like this. So let me reverse it. Yeah. So the moment I select this particular packet, packet number 54518, so there's a lot of information associated with it, which uh, address, uh, what was the source address, what was the destination address, the source MAC, destination MAC, source port, destination port, and all. In addition, this there's an information about uh, the file is a JPEG file. That means uh, it's an image file. So I'll simply try to see what was there. So I'm trying to export these bytes, whatever bytes these are. Uh, let's store it as 1.jpg or let's say 11.jpg. Okay, we'll just later on see uh, what that was. So, yeah, maybe I can get some more of these. A lot of partial traffic being captured. There's something here also. So let's see what that is. We'll simply export these by bytes. Let's give it a name, say for example 12. Okay, let's try to see what these images were actually that I just captured. Now, if you can see on the screen right here. I have two files. This is an 11 and a 12. Okay, this is the one image that I was just browsing at the law department University of Kashmir. Okay, so let's assume it was not me browsing, it was someone another browsing, and I was just trying to capture the traffic. This is another image. See here, down here, another image. Oh, this is the same, I guess. So these are the images basically. So what I have done is that whatever that particular user, whatever that particular person was trying to browse over an instant connection, all I'm trying to do is that I was trying to actually see that whatever information he is uh, browsing in that moment. So this is a way I can say, uh, let's just get rid of this. So the information that was actually uh, over this HTTP connection was not secured. If this was secured, if this was encrypted, what I would get uh, would be a message that would not make much sense to me, that would not make rather any sense to me at all. And uh, even if I was able to get those contents, I will not be, uh, they will not be of any kind of help to me. But since the uh, information was exchanged over an HTTP, I could actually see what information he was trying to exchange, what information he was. So they, this could, uh, for in my case, these were some images. But in some other user's case, this might be something very vital or something very something very private that he does not want to share with someone else. So just because he browsed it on a, maybe a free Wi-Fi or an, uh, air, at an airport or some other place at a cafe or something like that. And simply whatever uh, transfers took place, they got exposed. Take one more example. Let me just close this uh, for once because the system is running very really slow. Uh, okay, so let's see. Let's go into this uh, website, Tech Panda. Uh, this is for demonstration purposes only. Now, it's taking a lot of time. Okay, so let's try to. So what I'm doing is that I'm trying to log in, as I said, uh, on an insecure network. I'm actually trying to log in uh, onto uh, maybe a social media account or a bank account or whatever it is, right? So let's say I log in admin at the rate of google.com. Let's give a password to it. Password 2010. So I'm submitting this information. Now once I submit, no, I don't want to save this information. So get rid of it, add a new contact. So I'm actually able to put in some information. Let's see, create a new contact. So this information 
may not make much sense here, but this may be very vital information to you. So yeah, this is this, and this is mass at the rate of abc.com. And say this information. So while then I'm doing all this, uh, let's go into Wireshark and see if Wireshark has captured something for me. Okay. Right. So let's see. Maybe. So if you're a computer science student, you do have the understanding that we do use these methods of get and post. Uh, uh, for the information communication with get all the information is down in that url with post it's basically appended to the actual packet so that's what i'm going to try and see if i can get any such information whatever credentials login username password whatever i have you oh, should the end of the button that's stupid okay so whatever information is there possibly if i can get off any of that Let's I need to recapture these packets. Data. I'll have to recapture. So in the meantime, while I recapture it, uh, I might have to restart it because it's uh, basically uh, responding very slow. One important thing is that that I can do on my uh, iPad as well. So in the meantime, I'll restart this. So one important thing is that uh, I told you that. Sir, we have lost to the audio. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. So, yeah, I was telling basically that if you want to capture, uh, uh, if you want to experiment with some uh, files, uh, what you can do for experimentation purposes is that you can simply go onto the Google and you can look for Wireshark captures. There's a complete repository of uh, these captures that you can find on the Google. Simply go there, look for which protocol uh, you want to experiment or play around with. Go there and download the files. So for example, I'm demonstrating here one with the DHCP. So as you can see that I'm uh, trying to look for the DHCP file. So I'm seeing sample captures for DHCP. In the meantime, Shahid, uh, I was asking about these uh, DHCP files. What are DHCP? What is DHCP protocol about? So I'm downloading the DHCP uh, Wireshark file. So this is a DHCP capture that I have downloaded here. And Jahangir, what's this DHCP we use it for? 
it is so for assigning the ip addresses i guess let me go to the configuration protocol yeah what's that about about assigning the ip addresses sir yeah so how do you do that so actually whenever there's a node it wants to basically to be identified on the network it needs an identification it will actually uh, request the dhcp server uh, that if you can please provide me an uh, uh, this ip address okay uh, the dhcp will give it a range of addresses that it may uh, this is called as dhcp offer usually uh, so the receive the uh, request well, let me just lower this so the downloads yeah let's see to the dhcp file yeah, we have a DSP file here. So I'm trying to open it. So yeah, there you go. There's a DSP file. And as I was telling about DSP, there are four things uh, associated with uh, this, uh, what we normally call as a DORA. If you have heard the uh, acronym, DORA is for, you try to discover. Then the DSP server actually offers you that uh, this is the IP address that I can uh, provide you among a pool of IP addresses, then you put on a DHCP request, uh, on a DHCP request, you actually tell them that uh, is this particular address available? Can I take this particular IP address? Uh, so these are the uh, this is a way to analyze it. See, uh, the source is saying this is the best way uh, I can demonstrate it. So source here, say for example, I'm trying to connect to the internet, so I don't have an IP address. So it says zero 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 zero, and uh, I'm asking my uh, I'm putting a broadcast message. Uh, for the DHCP server, so it's going on to like uh, 255, 255, 255. I'm, I'm asking uh, that uh, I'm here, please uh, recognize me, please discover me. I need an address, I don't have an address, so please, uh, if you can give me an address. Uh, so it is DHCP server actually offers me an address, okay, and it tells me that this is an address. If you want, uh, we can actually give you so. Uh, 192.168.01 is the DHCP server, and it's offering me a particular address. Now, among given pool of addresses, I might take up some particular address if I want to. So I'm requesting that can I have this uh, 192.168.0.10? Uh, if I can have this, if the address is available and uh, if there's no conflict, there are some uh, uh, cases uh, wherein you will find there are conflicts. Then that can be actually resolved using uh, ARPs. So yeah, uh, this is how a DORA actually works. So this is uh, the transfer, that is, this is the traffic that has been captured while performing a DORA. Okay, this is uh, the capture that has been, uh, this is a transfer that has been captured while you are trying to get an IP address for your system. So essentially, where can I use it? So if you're a network administrator and you are seeing that I have a system, it has a valid MAC address, it has everything, but it's not able to connect to the internet. So there's a possibility that something is happening in the DHCP handshake. Something wrong is happening with the DHCP handshake. And this is where you can actually exploit uh, such a case and uh, uh, troubleshoot your network and look for, for a particular system that why a particular node is not getting internet. So uh, this kind of a packet analysis is the good side of the packet analysis or the packet sniffing, where you are sniffing the packets, but for a good way to troubleshoot your own network and to see what's wrong with my network, okay? So this is another example. Likewise, uh, there are uh, almost uh, captures available for every single protocol, every single communication are there. Uh, if you do not have your own captures or if you cannot get a capture of your own, all you need to do is that you go to the Google and you try and get the sample capture uh, from the Wireshark website. So uh, this is another positive use of this. Then in addition to this, uh, uh, if you have certain other tools, uh, so for example, if you make use of an Nmap, uh, or uh, if you can somehow put your system into a monitor mode, then uh, the possible way is that you, if you want to say, for example, take the uh, Wi-Fi passwords, uh, if you want to take the system passwords, if you want to take uh, the system IDs or some, Wireshark can only be used for that, but that will be like the negative side of the Wireshark. So wherein what you can do is that if you're on, on a network and if you want to see the, uh, IDs, subscription IDs, and the pass keys of that particular network. So what you can do is that you can join in the network, uh, throw everyone off the network. It's a very simple procedure to do a single command, or is all it will take you to 
through everyone of the network. And the moment they try to reconnect to the network, they will have to basically do this uh, uh, kind of a login. The moment they try to do the login, that's where you get to the packet, and that's where you try to actually get the uh, SSID and the passkey of that particular network. So if you actually want to actually log into a secure network, a network that's secured by password, so Wireshark again uh, can be used uh, in those cases as well to capture that traffic that where you you are trying to do the logins. But Wireshark alone won't be sufficient enough. You will need other tools as well to perform uh, these kind of captures. Uh, but the good part here is that um, as computer science professionals and network security professionals, I would encourage you to use these kind of tools for the good purposes. Uh, with the aim of uh, securing your network, with the aim of troubleshooting uh, uh, for the errors or the loophole or the limitation that are in your system, instead of uh, going into the darker side of it. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's it. I will stop here. And uh, thank you very much. Now, if there are any questions, uh, I'd like to know. In the meantime, I'll restart my system and uh, go for that one demo of uh, showing you that what are the credentials I will try to, try to use. Uh, I can actually exploit them as well. So I'll try to go for that as well and while I restart my system. So if there are any questions in the meantime, you can please go ahead and ask me. Uh, see, uh, the traffic, see the traffic that is over the HTTP, see you can capture the traffic, right? But the thing is that, uh, but the thing is, yes, uh, uh, just one second. Sir. So you can actually uh, capture the traffic, but the moment uh, we say it's an HTTPS traffic, that's what you need to understand. The moment we say HTTPS traffic, for HTTPS traffic, essentially, uh, you have uh, SSL security over there or a TLS security over there. Once you have TLS security over there, now TLS is actually three components, three very important components associated with it. It has uh, the uh, key exchange algorithm associated with it. So that means uh, uh, the algorithm that has been used in this case uh, for sharing of the keys then it is an encryption algorithm associated with it that means the uh, information or the traffic whatever is there is actually being uh, secured uh, with some encryption algorithm and then there's third which is your hashing algorithm that means the information has also been compressed as well which has been uh, compressed as well now in that case what you will do is that what is this noise? What's the noise? Yeah, thank you. So uh, then there's a hashing algorithm involved as well for the compression purposes. So to analyze these kind of traffics, you need to get rid of um, uh, your uh, hashing. That means whatever hashing has been done, if you can undo that. If you can undo the encryption algorithm uh, that I was used actually for uh, securing the packets. And uh, to do that, if you can somehow uh, get into the key exchange algorithm and try to understand what keys have been exchanged, then that can lead to the decryption as well. So if you can go through all that procedure, which actually uh, is possible with certain algorithms, but is not possible with certain algorithms. Say, for example, if it's an AS, uh, AS encryption, then it's uh, very, very, very unlikely uh, that you will be able to decrypt but say, for example, if it's a DS encryption, that's, yeah, yeah, actually very much you can actually decrypt that as well. So it depends upon the algorithms uh, that are being used by that particular system that's there. Uh, if I have 3G, was going to my mobile. Yes, actually, you can use uh, for that case as well, but uh, you will have to uh, put it in your monitor mode. So there's a, basically a monitor mode. Uh, the moment you put it on the monitor mode, that's where you can actually access all possible devices on that uh, uh, particular network. And you have to also enable the promiscuous mode for your virtual network. So it has to be, it has to be uh, a combination of monitor mode as well as the promiscuous mode as well. In that case, uh, then there was, I guess. Uh, uh not exactly uh dora process but yes uh there are similar exchanges a lot of a lot of these protocols make similar exchanges of what we normally essentially call it handshakes so yeah there's a tcp handshake there's an ssl handshake uh there's a uh, this dscp handshake so they're essentially almost the same processes but uh the intent is different but yeah all of these are like handshakes actually and uh, they do perform so even if in the case of ssl if you want to uh actually create an ssl connection between these two guys so there's an SSL handshake actually, which is actually uh, a combination of three different states that you create. 
so that's almost similar to the dora process or if you see a tcp handshake that's almost again a similar process if you see a udp handshake that's almost a similar process the intent is different but the procedure and the methodology is the same there's no difference with that uh yeah jahangir go ahead please so there was a question in the uh, previous lecture of dr sai satish yeah it was regarding if i had exposed my uh, mac address is it a problem for me and uh, doctor uh, was of the view that it could not be a problem but i was the of the view that it can be a problem and it can cause a, lar a large one problem a big problem so can you please elaborate it is there a problem if i expose my mac id or is it not a problem uh so uh, essentially what what's like your argument on being this a problem so how do you say it's a problem like the way you already said if there is a uh, firewall uh, based on mac ids like uh, you have uh, in your uh, there in your network for example at kashmir university you have already allowed some you have already uh, whitelisted some of the mac ids to connect to the network and those are the uh, only devices which can connect to your network so if i had your mac id i can connect to the same network in the see, same uh, manner see yes. uh, i will say uh, partially partially uh, you are right and partially uh, sadesh sir is also uh, say in a way these mac address they are basically are limited in scope right so a mac address your mac address is not known uh, to the outside world so your mac address makes sense as long as it's your on your own network outside your own gateway it does not make any sense to the outside world outside so world it, identifies you with the ip address so, so if you are trying to in, manipulate jangir uh, i will just finish it off and you can have a follow up question yes, so sir, if sir. you are trying to uh, basically do away the way i have quoted an example of uh, how i can use mac addresses so if you are trying to do the uh, uh, do away with the mac addresses within your network then yes exposure of a mac address can be a vulnerability but if you are using the same mac mac address and try to do away with it from an outside network case then it won't make any difference to you because it actually does not uh, it actually does not make any chance of this uh, chance of having your this mac address i mean say there's no provision or no uh, uh, vulnerability that can be exploited from the outside network but within the network yes you can actually exploit so that's what i mean to say that partially uh, both of you are correct so like uh... i am running an application for example i am running an aadhar application i am aadhar enrollment officer and the only protocol they are uh, filtering is my mac id they have registered my uh, computer mac id so that i can enroll uh, the these residents so if i were a person gets my mac id he too can do it in the same way in that case so he is not from my own network can you come again and hear like so uh, i'm saying that uh, nowadays as you see so uh, many uh, companies are uh, providing work from home system so yeah. they have registered they have registered the mac ids okay. in the same way i'm also a, i'm also aadhar enrollment operator so and okay. uh, the uid has uh, ma has set my mac id as whitelisted my mac id for aadhar enrollment so if a person outside my network even outside my network he has my mac id he can also do the uh, he can also run the application of uh, these enrollments other enrollments in the same manner oh uh -huh. can't he so so see basically uh, as i said earlier also mac address are not particularly sensitive and they are actually available only within your local network right so if uh, you are saying that my mac address is how i'm being recognized by a particular server then mac address alone cannot actually recognize and uh, cannot actually play a role in your recognition so it's not mac address only basically you are using okay you can so uh, the mac address essentially is not available once the traffic actually leaves your uh, local area network right although if you are using uh, ipv6 with the ip address uh, the ip address may be based on the mac addresses which were essentially called as a mac binding procedure but mac address essentially only makes sense as long as it's within your own network so by making mac binding so if you take a combination of these two then uh, uh, you can actually say that it has an impact but still uh, mac address keep on changing so you can actually make a change so sometimes what people try to do is that they try to uh, hide their mac address that does not make much sense see i have a machine i can actually uh, run multiple macs on my same machine right 
because the machine is essentially recognizable within the local network with outside network this mac address is not going to uh, make any sense or make much sense to unless you are using mac binding concepts and even then essentially the, these are actually these ip addresses that are actually used to identify your machines and not your mac address mac address only makes sense as long as they are within the local area network and not outside it there's someone this is work only when is a kind of on the outside network or if user outside network can be in this outside network that's only when using on network on this. Yes, it essentially uh, works on uh, when you're in a particular network on the same network. So it can actually uh, uh, take data from multiple interfaces, but those interfaces are on your same network. See, uh, what you need to understand here essentially is that how a machine or how a device or how a packet sniffing tool actually uh, is able to capture the uh, capture the traffic or is it actually able to sniff the tra traffic, is that it actually enables its uh, network interface card. The NIC card is actually what's being enabled in this case, right? So uh, whatever traffic comes from the outside essentially actually goes to the, your router and does not come to your system. And from that system, then uh, it's actually, so if you are having a broadcasting mechanism, maybe you can have some access to the data, but essentially uh, whatever uh, data is being regulated on your own network, you can, uh, you can basically uh, sniff that particular data. You cannot sniff the data that's directly coming from outside network. So you can sniff it from multiple interfaces, but those interfaces have to be on the same network, on on, not on different networks. You need to be on the network actually if you want to sniff those packets. You cannot sniff something which you're not part of. Uh, Sharda, you were asking something? Okay, uh, so I guess uh, I'll stop here.